Reformed Church. Normally what you do when you hear something, when you hear him preaching on uh, the radio, or you're hearing preaching, if people don't even normally r- listen to radio anymore, but on your podcast or wherever you're listening, right, online, uh, on YouTube, if you listen to something that has to do something with the Lord, what you're really doing is you're comparing it against what you've heard before. Like the knowledge in your mind that you know, you're comparing it against that, and you're saying, does that jive with this? Does that jive with this, right? Now, what I'm going to tell you is that a lot of times the things that you'll hear here, many of those things will will make some sense with what you heard but then it'll just take a curve with what you heard and it won't sound exactly like that right and that's the part that sound feels kind of like like you know when the lord said that that those that he loves he chastens which is just another word for correct that doesn't mean that he gets a whip from a tree and whips you that means that 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 he corrects you that the ones that the lord loves he corrects right because the lord showed he manifested his love to us by dying on a cross right so if the, when the lord tells you that he loves you he wants to correct your mind now there's something very important and i'm getting to the key here there's something very important that he wants to correct your mind about and that is the cross he doesn't really care to compare your mind against any against any natural thinking that you have about eagles or trees or farming or whatever other analogy people use to explain the bible he just wants to correct your mind as it has to do with jesus christ and him crucified right and that really honestly is the key when you hear something specifically here i'm talking about not anything else that you would listen to but specifically here well i guess for that matter yes and anything that you listen to really that has to do with the lord do, do this for me as you remember and you recall it right First, acknowledge the Lord and say, Lord, you know what? You're my truth. I have no need that any man teach me. I, all that I have need of, Lord, is that you show me, because there's a very key verse that the church loves to preach, which is true, right? Which is that he has given us his spirit to lead us into all truth. It is not the job of your pastor, your mother, your father, your grandma to lead you into truth. That is the job of the Spirit of God, and nobody else can do that for you. Nobody can do that for you. Only the Holy Spirit can do that for you. And that's, that happens to be the one that we have living on the inside of us. So imagine how well equipped we are, right? So we are at a place today, if you're saved, right, and that you have received the Spirit of God on the inside of you, so you have a teacher with you 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So we have no need to be confused even though sometimes we enter into confusion. Why? Because here's what we do. Again, we compare what we're hearing to what we heard before. That causes confusion because then you picture your pastor that you love so much and he, he dedicated your children and look at what he said and now you're telling me this, I'm so confused. Or you read a book and he's a very well-known evangelist and you got all of this stuff. And you know what the truth is? You could, it, could be, it, it doesn't have to be so complicated. It's very simple. Very, very simple. When you hear, acknowledge the Lord as your truth. And then number two, everything that you hear, make sure that it is according to Christ. That's all. I'm not asking you to compare it against what somebody told you. I'm not asking you to compare it against, you know, uh, whatever, you know, when people hear all that we'll mount up with wings like eagles and then people go off and they start studying eagles and then that explains why we are the way we are or what, what that verse means. You will never understand something spiritual by something natural. Never. That's just a key thing. It's in Corinthians, right? The natural mind cannot know God. Simple. The natural mind cannot know God. If, if someone that doesn't have Jesus can know that eagles mount up with wings, then you don't need Jesus for that. So the, the key thing here that I want to tell you as you listen to this message and as you listen to other messages that you continue in, when something just shocks you and you're like, oh, wow, right? Because you, you'll either go two ways. You'll, you'll, either, you'll either be shocked and be like, oh, I got to run back to where I hear things that are familiar, or you'll say to yourself, you know what, Lord? I am so tired because I was tired of this, right? I told you I left my first church because I just wanted to go to a church where I would be taught scripture. That's what I want. I didn't want, I I got tired of opinions. I don't want opinions. I want scripture. I don't want tradition. I want scripture. And then the Lord grew us to where we are today where, you know what, nothing's changed. I just want the things that I know that I hear about you, Lord, and who I am to line up with Jesus, right? So very simple. If I, if I say something to you, if Pastor Mike says something to you, if you hear something Miss Lindsay is saying up here, and just before you kick it down the road and reject it, say, does Jesus have that? If he doesn't, then don't receive a word that I'm saying, right? Because we have been made this thing that we, the church loves to talk about, which is a new creation, new creation that means that it's not like the old one that is like this world you have been made a new creation the question you want to ask yourself is who's who have you been made like and who made you 
right? And we're going to talk about that today a little bit. Who have you been made like and who made you? And if you want it to sound natural and carnal and earthly, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> you do not want to be here. If you want what you hear to sound natural and carnal and earthly, then you could just go off and listen to the news because that is natural and carnal and earthly, right? The things of this world are natural, carnal, and earthly. I do not expect, and hopefully you, do, you, you don't either, expect the things of God to be natural, carnal, and earthly because he is none of those three things. God is not natural. He is not carnal and he is not earthly, right? God is heavenly. Therefore, the things that we hear, you know, sometimes I, I pictured it this way while Miss Lindsay was singing. This thought came into my mind. You know, when, when we hear, when over the years you hear things and you, at, you we always, Christians always ask the right questions in their mind. We always do. We ask the right questions. You know, you know the kind of question that Christians ask themselves? Can I lose my salvation? That's a very important question. We ask the right questions. It's just that we get answers that are like, oh, okay. See, when somebody tells you to the answer to that, well, you know what? It depends really, you know, it, it has to do with a lot of variables. Um, it depends really, you know, have you been obeying the Lord? Have you been keeping his commandments? You know, have you been, have you been a godly individual? You know, because if you fall off the wagon and you start the backslide and you start doing things that are unbecoming of a Christian, you know, it's not like the Lord is just going to just put up with what you're doing and just allow you to get away with murder. So, of course, you know what? You can lose your salvation if you go down the wrong road. Now, the, what's missing from everything that I just told you there has nothing to do with Jesus at all, at all. Nothing that I just told you right there has anything to do with him. It has everything to do with you, right? But we hear stuff like that, and we know it bothers us, right? Like Christians hear that. Like, and, and here's how I know it bothers you, because you all have the same spirit that I do. So even though you might have bought it hook, line, and sinker, it still bothers you, right? For somebody to tell you that Jesus died on a cross for you, and he did what you could not do because of the weakness of your flesh. So in other words, you were saved because of what he did, not because of what you do. And when somebody tells you that, you know what, that, and you know that you don't do everything right. I don't do everything right. You don't do everything right 24 hours a day, seven days a week, right? So you already know that part, that you don't do everything correctly. But, but when somebody tells you now that your salvation is dependent on that behavior, right, that's where the problem is. And the problem is because if I were to tell you that if the Spirit of God dwells in you and you have received the salvation that was given to you freely and paid for by, the, by Jesus Christ dying your death on the cross, right, that would be, that has nothing to do with you and has everything to do with him, right? Jesus said something that is key that we have not grown to understand fully. He said, it is finished that left nothing for you and me to do nothing he died for us while we were still sinners therefore when you receive a the finished work of jesus christ you're receiving what is done not what has to be done but what is done right what is finished what is complete right so so how do you how do you because then people say well how do you know the truth how, how can you discern well here again here's the this is the best thing ever right we have been given a spirit that is able to discern on the inside of us. So we have been given a spirit that knows between the spirit of error and the spirit of truth. And, and in order to know what is of the spirit of error and what is of the spirit of truth, you know what we're taught? He said, make sure that that which is said is said according to Christ having come in the flesh. In other words, you know what happened? He, Jesus Christ was born and took a body like ours, not because he wanted to see what we felt like, but because he needed a physical body to be able to die in it right? Jesus was not going to die in a heavenly body, right? He needed an earthly body in order to allow an earthly body to be punished, right? And an earthly body to be crucified and an earthly body to be able to die in it. Whose death was he dying? His own death? Was he dying his own death? I mean, we won't talk about this today, but just something really good to think about. Whose death was he dying? Because if he was dying his own death, then it must, because, it must have been because he was some kind of sinner, right? Because he sinned and he needed to pay the wage of sin, which is what? Death, right? Is that what he was dying for, his own sin? No. Okay, so if he was not dying his, for his own sin, whose sin was he dying for? Mine. So if the wages of sin is death and he died for my sin, what Miss Lindsay was, was, was saying before preaching, and I, I can say preaching because she was, she was heralding the truth, right, when she was up here before, right? She was saying, Lord, thank you for taking our death and for delivering us from corruption. See, most, most people cannot accept because of earthly thinking that we've actually been delivered from death and from corruption. 
But we will believe that you can lay hands on the sick and see them recover, but we don't believe that you've been delivered from death. We do believe that Jesus said that he, we could raise the dead and cast out devils, but we don't believe that we've been delivered from death. Well, I have a news flash for you. If you haven't been delivered from death, you have no, no business thinking that you could raise someone from the dead because you cannot give what you do not have, right? The apostle said, such as I have, possess present time, I give unto you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. He is giving from what he has, right? If you don't think you have resurrection power on the inside of you, which we do, obviously, and it's not like some kind of superpower that has kryptonite as an antidote to it, right? This, this power that we have is because the one that is in us, right? In other words, what we have is because who lives in us. It's not just because we have this thing and God put this power to heal in us. It's that we have, it's, it's him that dwells in us, right? It's an important thing. So that, that was a lot said, but there was a, a lot of good things there that I think are going to help us understand what we're talking about today. So in, in Judges chapter 13, we were talking about Samson last service, and there is one piece of there that I want to start with. Again, while you're hearing, make sure that the things that you hear, that if I tell you that you have something, that you, you can at least have an inkling that Jesus has this too. So if he has it, and we are heirs and joint heirs with him, then that probably means you have it too, right? If you were not an heir with Christ, and that means what he has is his and it ain't yours, but since we are joint heirs with him, then that means that you can say, Lord, what you have been given by the Father, so I have been given. When somebody tells you that you're a new creation, you already know who you've been made like because you have been made as he is in this world, right? You have been made in his likeness and in his image, right? That's who we've been made. This carnal body is not like his, like he is. It's the only part of us, this body and our unrenewed mind are the only two things that are not like he is. But then again, that's why the Lord encourages us to renew our mind, right? In, in Romans chapter 12 and other places, right, talks about the renewal of our mind. Why? So our thinking can be in line with his thinking. So when you hear something, say, Lord, what do you think about that? Instead of asking your carnal mind that we should not lean on, instead of asking your own understanding, what do you think, right? How about you ask the, the teacher in you, Lord, what do you think about this, right? What do you think, right? The, the, the Proverbs chapter 4, I believe, or 5, I'm not, actually, I think it's 3, right, says that we should not lean on our own understanding. You know what normally people do when they listen to stuff? They lean on their own understanding. That's what they're comparing it against, right? That's what the Lord asks us not to do. Um, in, in Judges 13, what you, what you see is, is it, it names Samson's dad, and then it names this one lady, which is, I, I call her like the lady with no name, right? Samson's wife is not named by name right? And it's not obviously because she's a woman, because there's plenty of women named in the Bible, right? But, but uniquely here in this instant, Manoah, which is Samson's dad, he is named, and Samson, of course, is named, but the wife is not. And, and that, th there's, a, there's a perfect reason for that, right? And that is the word Manoah, Manoah, right? The name Manoah means rest, right? If you, if you look that up and you, there's, um, Olive Tree is a Bible program that's out there. East Order is another Bible program that's out there. Uh, and, and there's plenty. Uh, Takarda is another Bible program that you can download and use Bibles for free there. And if you were to click on a Strong's Concordance, right, that lets you see Manoah, and you click on that, you'll see that it means rest, right? So, so first was rest, right? And it says that rest had a wife. But in Judges chapter 13 and 14, it talks about how rest was not with his wife, right? Now, Judges 13 starts off by talking about, in other words, the subject of this is not really Manoah and Samson. Judges is speaking about, really, about the children of Israel is what it's talking about. See, it says, it starts off in verse number one saying that, again, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. What was the evil that they did? It was unbelief, right? The evil that the children of Israel did, any time that you see in Kings and in Chronicles that it would say, and King so-and-so and King Ahaz, and he did evil in the Lord's sight, it wasn't meaning that, you know, they, he was killing people and lying and saying bad things to other people. What that means is they were in unbelief, right? They would not follow the Lord. They would not believe the Lord, right? Miss Lindsay was talking quite a bit up here about loving God. When you sing a song about loving the Lord, right, normally Christians are like, yes, Lord, I love you. And you know, you know why you say that? It's not because just because you have a feeling towards him now. 
The reason why you actually say that you love the Lord is because you have believed what he said. And 1 John talks about that if we believe the Lord, right, if we believe the Lord and love our brethren, in other words, it talks about the, the commandment that the Lord has given us to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, and strength and to love our neighbor as ourselves. To love him, right, is to believe the Lord, right? He says, if you, if you don't believe me, right, if you don't have faith, if you don't continue in the things that I'm speaking to you, then you are not my disciples, right? In other words, you can't say that you love the Lord and then at the same time not believe what he's saying. So actually, when we say that we love him, it's not just, even though a lot of times we communicate that we, or we uh, understand that or we kind of think about those words like, Lord, I love you, along the line sometimes of, Lord, I just, I have this feeling towards you that I love you, which you do, but really where that feeling towards God is coming from is because you have believed what he says. In other words, when, when people tell you that you have been delivered, when people tell you that God has saved you, when people tell you that you, you are above and that you are not beneath, when people tell you that you have been seated with the Lord in heavenly places, we love all that, right? And that is true. See, we, we hear truth and we like it. We hear truth and we like it. But it's not until somebody actually explains to you what it means to be seated with him in heavenly places that you're like, oh, no, that's not true, right? Because it's, gonna, it's not going to sound carnal, right? In other words, for us to say that we've been seated with him in heavenly places, Jesus is set above all principality, power, and dominion, and every name that is named, right? When, he, when the Lord says that he seated us with him, it means that we have been set also above all of the things in this earth and the death that is in it, and above all principality or power or any dominion that is in this world or in the heavens, excepting the heaven of God, right? Which there are heavens, right? But there is only one heaven of God, right? But so we have been given authority there. But that makes sense, right? Because when you hear something heavenly like that, and you're like, okay, is that true? Is it true that I have been set above demons and the devil and principalities and powers of this earth? Is that true? Well, the first question to ask yourself is, well, is Jesus above those things? The answer to that would be yes. Every Christian would tell you, yes, he is above all those things, right? The, the other question is, does the Bible say anything about casting out a devil all over the place, right? Right? How can you do that? Because you have authority over those things. If you were not over them, you could not do it, right? It would, in other words, what it would end up like, and I mentioned this before recently, right? You would, you would tell a devil to get out, and he'd say, well, instead of getting out, I think I'll get in you instead, right? But when you have authority over that, just as they would respect, right, Jesus, right, they also respect you, right? It says, so Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but you to the other man that tried to cast out a demon is an incantation. You, I don't know. Why did they know Paul? Because Paul had Jesus. Why do they know Jesus, right? Because he is the Lord, right? So, so, so there's something to be said, right? When you hear somebody tell you the things that you've been delivered from, the love of God that you have, it's because you've believed, right? You have believed the things that the Lord has said to you. So the children of Israel, the evil that they did was that they would not believe the Lord. So when they entered into unbelief, which Hebrews 3 and 4 talks about, that was the thing that kept them out of the promised land right it, saying kept them out of the promised land is the same thing as saying kept them out of heaven right in other words what is the one thing that keeps people um away from the salvation that jesus provided what is that people what is that keeps people out of heaven quote unquote the people that people say that but what it really means is what is it that keeps people away from salvation most people will say it's their behavior right oh because they've been on drugs you know for years or they're an alcoholic or listen it has nothing to do with that it has nothing to do with your behavior or what you do jesus was sitting with prostitutes and tax collectors which were thieves and 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 harlots right and and he would be, sit with anyone that would listen to him, right? You are saved because you believe, not because you earned your way to the kingdom. If you could earn your way to the kingdom, then we didn't need Jesus, right? In other words, if I could be good enough in and of myself to, to, for Peter, quote unquote, to open up the gates of heaven and let me in, then Jesus could have saved the trip and his death and his suffering, and he could have stayed in heaven and just let the best of the bunch get in, right? But, but it's interesting, right? Our salvation was, was unattainable by all of us, right? In other words, Romans chapter 3 says that we, we had all gone out of the way, right? None, there were none that were good. There were none that understood. We have all, it says, gone out of our way and become unprofitable. In other words, Jesus came because none of us could be saved on our own. None of us. And, and th there's not a single solitary Christian that has a spirit of God on the inside of them that should not believe that, right? We received what we could not earn, right? 
And Miss Lindsay even prayed it before. So therefore, you cannot keep what you did not earn, right? If we receive the salvation from the Lord without our works, how could I maintain it with my works, right? If, if, if the very thing, the re- very reason why Jesus has to, had to come was because of the weakness of my flesh. In other words, flesh does not mean sin. Flesh is just my body and my carnal thinking. In other words, just being natural, born into this world, having, having the sin of Adam in me, right? If, if I was born a son of Adam, there was nothing that I was going to be able to do, and the Lord knew that, to be able to earn salvation. So what did he do? He loved us so much that he sent his only begotten son, so whoever believes in him would not perish. Believes. And and he didn't qualify that with anything else other than just believing. In other words, he did for me what I couldn't do for myself. Therefore, I cannot maintain what I have received apart from my works, right? I can't maintain with my works the thing that I received apart from my works, right? It has, again, the difference in that is that, that you'll hear is one thing has to do with Jesus, the other teaching or doctrine has to do with you. Right? That's what we should be rejecting as the church. We should be rejecting as the church the things that are not according to Christ and according to my behavior. If it is according to my behavior, we might as well be under the law. Right? The law was about your behavior. Right? The law of Moses was everything had to do with your performance. But what happens is today we have Christians that live under the grace of God, trying to do the commandments of God, right? the Ten Commandments, which are the law. Right? Which obviously the law replaced with the law of faith, but instead of living by faith in Jesus, right? In other words, it's no longer I that live, but it's Christ that lives in me, which we just talked about. And this life that I now live in this body, in this flesh, I live it by how? By faith in the Son of God that loved me and gave himself for me. Everything that you heard this morning can be described in Galatians 2.20, right? I live it how? By faith. Not by performance, not by your works, not by you trying to be good. There are none that are good apart from the Lord. So here's what I want to get to today. There is a a, a verse in John chapter 15 that Jesus said, and very, very, very simply put, he said, without me, you can do nothing. Without me, you can do nothing. And what he was talking about, and I'll explain it to you in a second, that we cannot be fruitful in our lives without Jesus. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, temperance, faithfulness, right? Gentleness, kindness, self-control, all those things, temperance really, right? All of those things, in other words, we, and, and not only those things, but in other words, we cannot be fruitful without the Lord. In what you'll see in Judges chapter 2, so, sorry, Judges 13, 2, it says that there was a certain man from Zorah of the family of the Danites whose name was Manoah or Rest. And his wife, it says, was barren and had no children. You know what that means? She was fruitless. In other words, she could not bear fruit. Barren is she could not bear fruit. Remember that what this started out is as the children of Israel did evil in the Lord's sight, and he sent them under the dominion of the Philistines, right? So, so what is it that a God that is so loving does? If sin that came from Adam, if people are perishing and dying because of their lack of knowledge of the cross, right, and they are dying and they are under the dominion of the people of this earth, right? right? Or they're under the dominion of sin and of death. What would a loving God do? Well, we already know the answer to that. He sent Jesus, right? In a body like ours to die in it, right? But, but, but what the picture here, right, should be testifying about Jesus, right? Because that is what all Scripture should do. Scripture is not there to give you a moral lesson so you can try harder tomorrow and it can be a better day. Scripture testifies about Jesus, right? Jesus himself right, taught from Scripture, from the Old Testament, those things that it testifies about him when he was on the road to Emmaus, right? So here he says that she was barren, right? So rest had a wife, but the wife was barren, right? And and then it says, an angel of the Lord came to her and says, you are barren, but you will conceive a son. So here's what he's saying to her, just to break it down for you. The Lord, right, an angel is just a messenger, right? An angel doesn't make up this stuff. An angel is just a messenger of God. God is telling his people, right, right, in this context. But we, you can say he's telling Manoah's wife, right, the, the, woman, the woman with no name, right, which is really the people of Israel, symbol of the people of Israel. He's saying to her, he's saying, you will bear fruit, but you will only be able to bear fruit in rest. That is the only place that you will bear fruit is in rest. And, and I'll explain this to you in a second. We also were unfruitful, right? I was just talking to you about Romans chapter 3. We were unfruitful. We could do no good. We could not bear any fruit. Jesus said in John 15, without me, you cannot bear fruit, right? So when, when were we able to bear fruit? 
It's when we received our rest. And rest, and there's plenty of stuff on Reform You that, that can kind of catch you up here, but just to give you a, a synopsis of this, the rest that we received, right, was the Spirit of God. In other words, Acts chapter 2, right, when the Spirit of God came into this world and he made his home on the inside of us, right, that was a fulfillment of John 14 where Jesus said, me and my Father will come and make our abode in you. We will make our home in you. He said, the world will see me go, right, He says, and they will not see me. He says, but you will see me. In other words, I will come again, he said. The world won't see me, but you'll see me. And he was asked, you know, how is it that you're saying that you're going to come back and the world won't see you, but will see you, right? And what he was talking about was that he would come live on the inside of us. And he said, I will manifest myself to you. In other words, I will reveal myself to you. Remember before I was talking to you that we have a teacher on the inside of us? He is our teacher. The reason why you know what you know today, the reason why you could hear a message about, about the cross and the provision that Christ has made, and it could, it, could, it could begin to make sense to you, and you can begin to understand those things, it's not because you have a bachelor's degree in divinity. It's not because you made it through high school. It's not because you know how to read. It's not because because you're so smart is because somewhere along the line you didn't lean on your own understanding and you allowed the spirit of God to enlighten the eyes of your understanding so that you would be able to see right who it is that you have living on the inside of in other words you began to hear them Ephesians chapter 1 talks all about that right the eyes of your understanding being enlightened in other words where there was darkness and blindness or short-sightedness right it says that, that you could now see so he so it says here that right Manoah Manoah was the husband, the the woman was barren, right? And in verse number four, he says, therefore, now therefore, please be careful not to drink wine or any similar drink or not eat anything unclean. For behold, you shall conceive, you shall bear a son. And and listen to this, because probably almost every Christian has thought about this, right? We, because I'm telling you, we asked the right questions, right? He says, and no razor shall come upon his head. Everybody wants to know why. We ask the right questions, right? Why could he not cut his hair? And then somebody tells you then, right? Because you read it, right? His hair gets cut, and all of a sudden, he loses all his power. So all we can equate that to is like Batman or Superman, or if you take away my hair, like, like, like does, listen, even though we buy stuff like this, it doesn't make sense to any of us, right? That somebody were to tell you that, what, he had the Spirit of God in his hair? And if you cut his hair, then the Spirit of God jumped out of him? That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make sense to anybody that anybody's power is in their hair, and if you cut their hair, they lose their power, right? It, doesn't, it never has made any sense to anyone, right? But when you see where that comes from, right? Um, Numbers chapter 5 around there. I, I won't go back and read it because we went through this last service. But Numbers chapter 5 or 6 talks about the, the vow of a Nazarite, Right? The vow of a Nazarite is a vow that an individual would make, not a baby that is in the womb, right? Because this says, right, that she would conceive a son, bear a son, no razor should come upon his head, for the child would be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he would begin to deliver Israel out of the Philistines, right? Out of the dominion of the Philistines. So you see, the whole thing here, right, is God delivering his people. Does that sound remotely familiar to anyone? God delivering his people, right? Like, it sounds like Jesus coming, dying on the cross for our sins and delivering us out of this world, right? Delivering out of, this, out of the dominion of Satan and delivering us out of the dominion and out of the sin of Adam, right? That sounds, that, that sounds familiar to all of us, right? So when you look for scripture to testify about Jesus, you can see it because the Lord will correct your mind as you're reading and you're like, okay, this has something other to do with hair, right? Like what I'm reading right now has something more to do than just some guy's hair. So when you look at it and stop looking at things naturally and say, Lord, teach me, you'll hear, you'll understand. You're asking the right questions, right? So it says, no razor would come upon his head. He would be a Nazarite from the womb. So a Nazarite was a man or a woman that made a vow. Samuel, the prophet, was a Nazarite, right? He also did not cut his hair. He had also made a vow. So a Nazarite is one who makes a vow to be separate unto God and to not drink any strong drink or anything that comes from the vine and also to let his hair grow, right, for it to be untouched. But the word Nazarite actually means an untended, untended vine, an untended vine. Now, that's important. Now, here, here's why, why. Because if you know what an untended vine is, what you would know is why no razor 
should touch his hair. Like, why was that important? And here's why. In Leviticus 25, if we can go there very quickly, Leviticus 25, and, and I, you know, I don't know about you, but when I, the first God knows how many years that I was saved, I would read Leviticus, and you know what? That was like the kind of book that if I wanted to go to sleep at night and I just couldn't fall asleep, I'd just read Leviticus because it's probably the most boring thing in the Bible just so I could just go to sleep because it's filled with a bunch of stuff that I didn't even understand. So I'd just read that because it, I, 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 it was like a guaranteed sleeping pill for me. I was going to sleep reading it, right? But, but when you're reading Scripture to see how it testifies about Jesus, everything changes, right? In, in, in verse number 1, of Leviticus 25, the Lord has spoken to Moses on Mount Sinai, saying, speak to the children of Israel and say to them, when you come into the land which I give you, in other words, when you come into the promised land, the, the, then the land, it says, shall keep a Sabbath to the Lord. So, I, I mean, this definitely you can read on your own time, but here's what happens. The, the, there were, the Lord, the Lord explains that there are six years where you're to work. Six years. And in those six years, you're to work the land, you're to prune the vine, right? Prune the vine. So think of yourself like, think of this. Think of like a pair of scissors and you're cutting somebody's hair, right? Pruning the vine, right? A Nazarite is an untended vine. In other words, just let it grow of its own accord. Starting to make sense now, right? Let it grow of its own accord. That is a Nazarite. A Nazarite is an untended vine. The rest that the Lord teaches here, where he gets into all of this, right? He said, six years you'll work. Six years you'll prune the vine. Six years you'll sow the field. But on the seventh year, it's called the Sabbath. The Sabbath is what? A rest, right? People think that means Sunday. It's not. Oh, it's Saturday. It's not. It's not a day. It's, a, it's where we live today. I'll explain that to you, right? It's where we live. We don't, we don't, people observe a day, and you can observe a day if you want, but what you're missing is the big picture, right? We live in a Sabbatism, right? We live in a Sabbath. In other words, we live with one who is in us who is named rest, Manoah, right? In other words, we have the rest of God on the inside of us, and I'll give you what that means in a second. On the surface, right, rest means no labor. I mean, that's simple. Everybody gets that, right? Rest is no labor. So, so if rest is no labor, so stay with me here. Six, six years they would work the land. Six years they would sow, reap from the land. Six years they would prune the vine. And, but he says on the seventh year that will be a rest for you. And then he says, and whatever grows, um, grows, just grows during that Sabbath rest, he said that will be food to you. Right? But the land will receive its rest at that time, right? And then he says, um, it, interestingly enough, it, I, I won't go through this with you, but he, he goes even to the seven years times seven. In other words, seven times seven is 49, right? But he says on the 50th year, that will be what the Bible calls the year of Jubilee, right? The year of Jubilee doesn't, it's not just a Jewish thing where you blow a ram's horn, right? The year of Jubilee is significant. That, that means, it says on that 50th year, if you jump down to verse number 11, it says, that 50th year shall be a jubilee to you. In it you will neither sow nor reap what grows, it says, what grows on its own accord. It says, nor uh, gather the grapes of your untended vine. That's the word Nazarite, right? Of your untended vine. It says, for it is a jubilee. It shall be holy to you. You shall eat the produce of it, right? The, you'll eat the produce of the field. So basically, here's the picture, right? You would not labor, but you would eat you would eat the produce of the land. In other words, you're going to eat from what you did not provide. Is that start, start, starting to sound familiar to you, right? That you would receive for what you did not work for. Can a person lose their salvation? Well, did you work for, for that which you received, right? We, we are us, right? The, the, the church is a picture of a people that have received that which they not, did not labor for. In other words, that's why we live in a Sabbath. Right? That's why the, the Lord said, keep the Sabbath and keep it holy. It wasn't just so that we would have a day to take a nap and not go to work or so that we would have a day where you can't go to Chick-fil-A, right? It was a day that what? That was significant about what? About you not laboring. Now, people take that like everything else. We take something that is significant to the church and we make it about our work. So in other words, so if you work, then that is the, a sign of the fact that, that, that you know, if, in other words, if you do labor, if you actually work on a Sunday, you've like broken some commandment of God. But what's the problem with that? Simple. It has to do with you and not with Jesus, right? Jesus himself said, you take 
and, and you, you'll circumcise someone on the Sabbath. But me, because I raised somebody from the dead on the Sabbath, you call me some kind of heathen, right? So, so what's the problem in that thinking? It's the same problem with our thinking that we have today. We judge things according to men's principles and not according to who he is and what Jesus has today, right? So, so it says that that 50th year would be a jubilee, right? A, a rest, basically. So what you're seeing there is that whether it be the seven, the seven sevens, right, which is 49 and then the 50th year, right, that would be a rest. Or if it was just the seventh year, that would be a rest. Here's the significance of that. Because you say, well, what do all these sevens have anything to do with Jesus, right? Let me show you. If you can go to John, John chapter 19, 31. John 19, 31. It says, um, it says, therefore, because it was the preparation day, the preparation day is the day before the seventh day, right? The preparation day is the day before the, the, the seventh day. It says that the bodies should not remain on the cross on the Sabbath, for the Sabbath, for that, for that, sorry, Sabbath was a high day. So, in other words, Jesus is hanging on the cross, right? And, and they see that it is the sixth day, and it's just coming into the seventh day. So they say, we don't want these bodies, right, because the Jews were very methodical about the seventh day. We're to keep it holy, therefore no work can be done, so nobody can be taking dead men off the cross on the seventh day, so we have to do it now. We have to take these men off the cross now. So they were going to go around and break their knees, right, so that their, their, their hold, if any energy was still left in their body that was still holding them up erect, right, would be able to give way and they would finish dying, right, basically, to put it bluntly, right? So, so they, they did that. They went around and the two thieves, they broke their knees. But when they got to Jesus, they noticed he's already dead. So they pierced his side, right? And it says blood and water uh, came out. The interesting thing to note there is that it is important for us to see and understand that D Jesus, right, basically worked, right? He was on this earth. He worked for six days, Right? He worked for, obviously not six literal days, right? But he worked for six days, and as he was coming into the seventh day, right, is when he died. So he died on that precipice, on the edge of the sixth day to the seventh day. Now, another thing that you'll see is when you, when you look at Acts chapter 2, is you'll see that Acts chapter 2 talks about the day of Pentecost, right? The day of Pentecost is what? It has to do with the, the 50th, right? The 50th. So, so it's interesting that we receive the Holy Spirit, which is really called our rest. In other words, I, I quoted to you Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. It's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. You can, you can translate that by saying rest. If it's no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me, if it's not I that work, but Christ that works through me, then, that, then he has given your body rest, right? He's given you rest. In other words, well, I, I've talked about this before, but where does stress in our lives comes from, right? Stress in our lives comes from when, when you have circumstances that are testing your ability, right? And when you feel your ability strained, when you feel like you are at the edge of what you can do, when you're at the edge of what you can do, think of in your mind, then stress ses sets in. If you're handling something great, there's no stress in that. Oh, it don't matter. I'm great. I'm doing it. I'm the, I'm the bomb. I'm the best there is, right? But when you can't handle something anymore with your ability, with your talents, with your mind, then you begin to stress, right? The Lord has made it so that we do not have to live lives like that, right? But that instead, instead of leaning on, on our own understanding, we lean on the mind of Christ in us. Instead of leaning on our own power, we lean on the power of God. How did Samson live as a Nazarite? You ever wonder? Because you look at that man's actions and they weren't great. <laughs> you, you don't see, I, it's hard to find anything that the man did right. I mean, if you, if you read, he was a judge of Israel. A judge of Israel that, whose only job was to lead the people into righteousness to be able to understand who Christ is, Right? That, that was his only job, for them to be able to know the coming Messiah, right? Yet, it's hard to find something that he did that was actually correct. But you know something that you see? You see Samson move. It says that the Spirit of God moved and as he was growing in wisdom, and he was growing in stature, right? He was becoming a man. It said that the Spirit of God would come upon him, and he would move and work. But you know what that's talking about, right? The Spirit working in him was, it was actually manifesting in strength, in physical Physical might, like he would kill 30 men with the jawbone of a donkey, right? In other words, it was physical strength that was being manifested. That strength obviously was not his, right? 
It's obvious that, you, in other words, it was supernatural strength. It was not strength that Samson had because of his good behavior. It wasn't, it was, and it wasn't, listen, it wasn't strength that he even kept because of his good behavior, right? Because no matter what Samson did, no matter what he did, or no matter what he said, no matter how he thought, the minute that he needed the power of God, he leaned, because he could have done two things. Leaned on his own physical strength, which I can guarantee you was not anything to write mama about, right? Or he could have leaned on the power of God in him, right? But, but we live, we live with the rest of God on the inside of us. We live with the power of God in us. Paul says that you that are of faith, that you would understand the exceeding greatness of the power that is towards you who believe, the, the power that is according to the power that rose Christ from the dead and seated him at the right hand of the Father, right? In other words, that, that's the kind of power that we have living in us. But yet we live our lives a lot of the times, not like Samson, who leaned on the power of God, but we live our lives a majority of the time just on natural stuff. And we get stressed like normal people get stressed, and we get overworked like other people get overworked, and we get, we get all fatigued in our mind just like other people do. Why? Because, because we're not taught that this life that I now live, it shouldn't be me living, but it should be Christ living in me. And what I really should be doing is keeping the command of faith, which is to believe him. Right? I, this life that I now live in the flesh, I live it by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. You know why? Because faith is what Jesus talked about when he said, I'm going to give you something that's easy and light. You ever wonder what he was talking about? When he said, come to me, all you that are weary and heavy laden, you that are stressed, you that have been depending on yourself, you that have been trying to be the best mother, the best dad, the best grandfather, the best grandmother, you that have been trying to be the best employee, the best employer, you that have been trying to work in this world to do the best that you can, he says, come to me, come to me, right, and I will give you what? Rest. What, what, what was he going to give us? Rest. How was he going to give us rest? Was he just going to throw a rest dove from heaven and say, rest, have it, right? I'm, 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 I'm being facetious for a, so we would think, how did he give us rest? Did he send it to us, you know, via our cell phone? How did I get rest? It's called the Spirit of God, right? The same one that gave Sam some rest from his own power, from his own strength, the same spirit that rose up a dead body from the grave, right? Jesus' dead, lifeless body rose it from the grave. It says he was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, which is just another word for the Spirit of God, right? He was raised up from the dead by that power that we have in us, right? It is, that's the rest that he's given us. And he said, my yoke is easy. The burden that I put on you is light. You know why? Because if, if truly what you hear out there is right, that what God demands of me is good behavior, good actions, good this, good that, that I be perfect in this, perfect in that, that I do this, that I do that right, that is not light. That is not light by any means, right? But, but it is light when he says, this life that you now live, here's the light part. Live it by faith. You know why? Because it's not your mind that you're leaning on, it's not your understanding, and it's not your teaching. I don't have to open up the Bible and say, okay, in other words, approach it like approach a math book or homework, right, from school that I would say, okay, Lord, um, I'm going to try to learn you. The natural man cannot understand the Spirit of God, right? We have been given the Spirit of God who is the one that knows all of the things of God, right? So we've been given that Spirit so that we could understand, so that we could know the deep things of God, right? So when it says here, when it talks in Leviticus, well, sorry, in John 19 we were, it talks about rest there, right? It talks about that he, the, the Lord, right, it, on six days he labored, and it was a pr on the precipice of the seventh day, and, and the Jewish people were taught for years that that was the day that you were to keep holy, that that day you would do no work. Why would that be? Why would that unique seventh day, the one that D Jesus died on the precipice of and brought us into the Sabbath, right? Why why would that be the day for us to do no work? And why is the church still working so much? Because what we should be receiving is the no labor. But instead of receiving not I that live, but Christ that lives in me, right? And, and Pastor Mike has a series called Yet Not I that I think has like 55 different episodes to it. That's probably exaggerating a little bit. It's like 20 something. But you can get all of that. All of that. I mean, you'll understand Galatians 2.20 inside and out, right? But the point here is, is that, that if he said 
that the Sabbath was to keep holy, a day that we would do no work. Ask yourself this question. Say, Lord, you know what? Say, say, Lord, why is it that the Sabbath is so important and what does that have to do with you, Jesus, right? And then you know what you would come to? That the reason why, see, Samson, Samson was born from rest, right? Manoah, the name means rest. He was born from rest. He, he was a Nazarite from his mother's womb, a man that did not even have the opportunity to make a vow. How do you make a, a Nazarite vow while you're still in your mother's womb? The, the answer to that is you cannot, right? You can't make a Nazarite vow like Samuel did, right, when, when you're still inside of your mother's womb. So he was born a Nazarite, right? From, and it was the working of God that he did that. So therefore, if it's the working of God, we shouldn't be looking for something to sound natural to us. It should make sense, but it doesn't have to be natural. So when you hear, okay, so Samson was born a Nazarite from his, his mother's womb. So the things that he did, you see him work by the power of God constantly. And you, and you can ask, well, what was it the thing then? Because his hair was cut and he lost all his strength. And then he took and he stood between those posts and he knocked it down and he died. I will tell you this. I don't know all of this. I haven't even gotten that far into Judges to really be able to tell you with all certainty like all the answers to all those things. And they're all good questions, right? But I will tell you this. I know that a man that lives by the power of God, that dies, only dies because of what he does not know about Jesus, right? That's all. Right? So, so the, fact that, the fact that Samson died, he died because of things that he did not know. A lot of the ways that he acted and spoke and he talked, he talked that way and he spoke that way because of things that he did not know. Right? But there were a lot of things that he did know as he was growing in wisdom. There were things that he did understand because you see that the manifestation of the Spirit was there for him. I, I will tell you this. Can I, can I, if, you, if you could hear this, there is no, um, there is nothing that we receive from God outside of the knowledge of Jesus Christ, right? Nothing. You, you, when it, it, let, me, let me show you this verse. If we can run over real quick, because we're wrapping up here. But if we can go to um, Colossians, I believe it is. And I think it's around Colossians 2. Colossians 2, 4. It says, now this I say, lest anyone should deceive you with persuasive words, right? So you always want to be vigilant, right? That you're not listening to someone and you're not thinking, you know what, that man, that woman, that's the most well-spoken individual that I've heard, right? What you're looking for is not eloquence, right? You don't want to look for eloquence. You want to look for things that line up with Jesus Christ as he is today. Because you can look for eloquence and you can be completely deceived just because it sounds pretty, right? So it's not about eloquence. It's about does it line up with what Jesus said, right? That, that's all that you want to know. Does it line up with what Jesus said, who he is? right? What he has, what he possesses today, that's what you want to look for, right? So he says in verse number four, this I say, lest anyone dece deceive you with persuasive words, for though I am absent in the flesh, yet I am with you in the spirit, rejoicing to see your good order and the steadfastness of your faith in Christ Jesus. See what he wants to see? That they would continue in faith, right? Is it, verse number six says, as you therefore have received Christ, and this is very important, right? As you therefore have received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him, you see what he just said there? Paul said to the church, as you have received Christ, in other words, the way you received him, walk that way. Right? Have you ever read in, in the epistles of Paul, he would say, you know, I think it's in Galatians where he said, in Galatians or Romans, one of the two, but he says, uh, walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. I'm thinking it's Romans 8, right? But walk in the spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Walk in the Spirit, right? Have you ever asked yourself, because we ask the right questions, right? How do I walk in the Spirit? But people water down walking in the Spirit like it's just, okay, Lord, I'm approaching my closet, and I want to know, should I put on the red one or the black one? Lord, I'm approaching this road. Should I go left or right? Right? And it's not like the Lord can't show you that, right? It's not that he can't show you whether you should go left or right if you needed to know where to go left or right, right? But the point is this, walking in the spirit is not about you getting directions from heaven so that you can do it, right? And Pastor Mike has even mentioned this also, right? Hearing directions from heaven and you doing them is the law of Moses, right? <laughs> don't do this so you don't do it. Do this and then you do it, right? Wash your hands this way and you do it. Don't wash your hands this way and you don't do it, right? That's the law of Moses. Getting directions, right? Getting directions and then doing it is the law of Moses. That has to do with your work, right? Walking in the Spirit is easy and light, and it is according to faith, right? Walking in the Spirit is what he just said. He said, as you therefore have received Christ, so walk in him. 
How did you receive Christ? By faith. Did you do anything else? Nope, because nothing else was good enough, right? You received Jesus through faith and only through faith in Jesus. And that is the only reason why you're saved. The only reason why you have the Spirit of God living in you has nothing to do with your works because I, I was the worst of the worst, right? I did all the wrong stuff. I believed all the wrong things. I hung out with people. I did drugs. I did all of the stuff that you should not do. I did it, right? But I was saved. Was I saved because of what I did? No, I, I, I'll tell you right now, no. <laughs> there, there were no good things that I was doing up until the day that I was saved, right, that had anything to do with my good behavior. Actually, all the contrary, completely the contrary, right? But what happened is, I, re I remember the day when I began to see and understand, right? When I began to hear a, a preacher in that Assembly of God church, and he was talking about Jesus, not about my works. He was talking about Jesus and not drugs. He was talking about Jesus and not my work. He was talking about Jesus and not what I had done. He was talking about what Jesus had already done and finished on the cross. And that's what piqued my interest, right? And as I kept hearing that, as I kept hearing that, that continuing in that gospel, that, that's the only thing that saved me, only thing. And if, and if you would admit it, if you would admit it to yourself that you were saved and there were none mighty around you, none, none wise around you. And what the Lord is meaning with that, there were none of you that had this thing figured out, so stop boasting because there ain't nothing that you did to bring you into the salvation that you so easily received, right, from all the labor that my son performed, right? So he says there, he says, as you therefore have received Christ, so walk in it. You know how you, how you, how do you walk in the spirit? The same exact way that you were saved, by faith. In other words, continue. And you know where faith comes from because faith comes from hearing the word of God. So when you hear the word that is of God, I'm not talking about words that people make up. I'm not talking about nice analogies. I'm talking about the word of God, right? When, you, when the word of God testifies about Jesus, when you hear that word, what happens? You begin to grow in the knowledge of the Lord. And as you grow in the knowledge of what you have, you will begin to walk in what is yours, Right? You cannot cast a devil out of someone if you don't believe that you have power in you, right? If you don't understand that you have been put above the things of this world. If you still think you're beneath it, if, if the thought of the devil showing up or some demon manifesting itself scares the boots off of you, well, then there's a problem because you don't know who you are yet. You were made new, but you're not understanding yet who you are. Right? You were made new. You got that. I was made new. I don't exactly understand what kind of new that means, but I know I was made new. The new creation that you were made is you were made as he is. Right? Right? You were made as he is. So he says, he says they're so walk in him, rooted and built up in him, not built up in anything else, not built up in carnal knowledge, but built up in him, established in the faith. He says, as you have been taught, abounding in it, with thanksgiving, right? Giving thanks to God. That's what happens. That's really what brings about thanksgiving is when you recognize what's been done for you, that's what brings about thanksgiving. Beware, it says, lest anyone uh, cheat you in verse eight. S stay with me for this last little piece and we're gonna wrap up here. Beware, lest anyone cheat you, it says, through philosophy and empty deceit, according to the tradition of men, according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ. You know what that is? That's a very eloquent way of saying what I just started this service saying, right? He says, don't let anyone cheat you, right, from what is yours according to either what? The traditions of men, which I talked about. The philosophy and empty deceit. According to, it says, according to the basic principles of the world. In other words, trying to understand what it means to mount up with wings like eagles and studying eagles is according to basic principles of the world. It is, in other words, it's like natural stuff. When you look at natural stuff to understand what God Almighty is saying, right? This is not your next door neighbor talking to you, right? This is God Almighty, the one that created all that you see, right? The one that has made you, the one that made you brand new, the one that sent his only begotten son to die for your sins, right? I mean, just try to get your mind around that. How does someone die for your sins, right? You did them. <laughs> How does he die for your sins, right? You're not going to understand that with natural thinking. You're not going to go over to Jerusalem and try to see the place where Jesus died and put your hand on the dirt, and you're going to get a revelation from that, right? The only way to understand that is by the Spirit of God. Only way to understand. He said, not according to the basic principles of the world, but according to Christ. Verse number 9 says, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. Look at verse 11. In him... 
you were also, listen now, you were also circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Let, 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 me, let me show you something here. We, it says we have been circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. Jesus said something interesting. He said, he said this temple, he said, I'm going to destroy it, and then I'm going to raise it up in three days. Right? He, he looked, he, he was surrounded by Jewish people. He said, destroy this temple. He said, and I will raise it in three days. He said, you know how many years it took our ancestors to set to build that thing? And you're going to tell us that in three days you're going to destroy it and you're going to raise it up? What was their problem? Natural thinking was their problem. Natural thinking. But he said, he, he said, and I'll, I'll quote it a little bit better so you can see it more clearly. In, in, and you don't have to go here, Brother Andrew, uh, Andre, but I'm just going to say it real quick. Mark 14, 58 says, we heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with hands. Listen to that because it's important. I will destroy this temple made with hands, and within three days I will build another made without hands. What did he just say there? He said that he would destroy this temple made with hands, and in three days he would build another made without hands. Right? The new creation that you have been made, right? You have been made without hands. In other words, the, the untended vine of the Sabbath was, you know what? Don't let men touch it. In other words, it grew, it grew, and I'm going to wrap all this together for you with a bow, hopefully, right? That, that, that untended vine grew of its own accord, it said. In other words, without men touching it, right? Without men disturbing it. But what that really mean, is meaning without the work of men, without men working for it. Jesus said, destroy this temple, and I will raise it up in three days. The one that was made with hands, I will raise up without hands. Right? So what, what, what he was talking about was the temple, right, whom we are. It says the temple, his body, whom we are. The body of Christ is called the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? The temple of the Holy Spirit. We have been made a new creation. In other words, we were made, we were made without hands. The new creation you were made was not of your work. It was of the work of God. The church has to let go of this idea that it, it is what they do that earns them anything with God. That what you have and will ever have and the grace that you receive and the access to the grace in which you stand is not your work, but it's the work of God in you, which he has already finished. And the only thing we have left to do is to take advantage and partake of what has been placed on the inside of you. We are so hung up with our work because we want to raise our hand and say, oh, God, look at what I did. I deserve what I did. Right? It's, it's, it has nothing to do with your work. It has nothing to do with your work. You could mess up time after time after time. Right? And believe me, you do. <laughs> you do. Because you don't even know the length of sin because the only thing you call sin is the thing you think is sin. Right? But if God would actually tell you, listen, everything that is not a faith is sin. <laughs> everything that is not a faith is sin. So you do so much stuff that has, but, but I know, I get it, right? We judge like, oh, like he came in and he was coming to church for such a long time and then he started drinking. He must have backslidden and fallen off the wagon and now he's lost his salvation. But we say stuff like that because we're looking with physical eyes. We're not living by faith, we're living by sight. What the Lord wants to do is teach us, stop living by your sight and start putting your eyes, right, on what I have done. In other words, let me enlighten your eyes. That, 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 that untended vine, right, needed to be undisturbed by the labor of men. Jesus died a death so that he could freely give us that which we could eat from, right, so that he could freely give us that which we could eat from without us earning it, right? In other words, the, the produce of the Sabbath day that was in the field, that was unworked, unsold for, unplanted, un anything by the work of men, he said that is going to serve for food for you, for your servants, for your donkeys, for your animals, for everybody. Everyone is going to eat from that which they did not work for. Isaiah very well said that, right? He said, come buy and eat without money, without price. In other words, come receive that from which you will never work for and have never worked for, right? He, he, we, we live today in the easy and light time, right? We live in a time that we should be taking advantage of every single thing that the Lord has done for us so that as anything, any circumstance that would come to you, come your way, when your boss is coming up to you, putting more and more pressure on you, telling you that you have to perform more, right? That you, if you want to raise, you'll do this. If you want to raise, you'll do that, right? When you feel the pressure that other people put on you, the peer pressure that comes from other people around you, right? Don't lean on your own understanding as though you're left up to your own mind to figure out life for yourself. 
You have received the Spirit of God who is called rest. And he has come in so that he can live so that you don't have to. And I get it. There's lots of things that we're still going to do. Lots of things that we're still going to do as we're growing. The only thing that I, that I admonish you in is let's keep growing in that which is right. Let's keep growing in that knowledge which is correct and is according to Jesus, right? And not growing in knowledge that is according to us and our works and what we do or what we have not done, right? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord, for all of the things, my God, that you continue, Lord, to speak to us, for, being a, for reminding us, my God, of everything that you have done for us already on the cross. Lord, that your suffering would not be in vain. Just because your suffering was not yesterday, Lord, does not mean, Lord, that it has to be absent from our minds. Sometimes, Lord, we can only have present in our minds the suffering and the things that have happened, Lord, just yesterday or even today, this morning. But my God, you suffered over 2,000 years ago, but that was a real you in a real body being really crucified, Lord, and it is clear that it was not for your sin. It was clear that the delight, Father, that you took in punishing your own son was not a delight in punishing his sin, but a delight, Lord, in crucifying our sin in his body on the tree. Because cursed, you knew, Lord, is anyone that hangs on a tree. You became, Jesus, accursed for us so that we could be people that understand what it means when we say, I am blessed. How are you doing? I am blessed. Why am I blessed? Because everything that we have was given to us and we were born with a silver spoon in our mouth. We were born with every advantage. We were born again, having given us everything. Put, having put your spirit, Lord, on the inside of us, having provided everything needful, Lord, for us, you put it already on the inside of us. Lord, that we would live this life, the rest of this life, Lord, that we have in this body, in this flesh, that we would live it, Lord, by faith, that we would live it just as we started with Christ, just as we received Christ, Lord, so let us walk in it. So let us walk, Lord, by the same faith, that we would continue, Lord, in one thing, be faith, that we would be diligent about one thing, hearing, Lord, the gospel and growing in faith in Jesus, growing in that which is according to Christ, not growing, not growing, Lord, uh, um, in, in the traditions of men, not growing, Lord, according to knowledge that is just based on the basic principles of this world, but to grow, Lord, in that which makes sense as it's compared to Jesus and who he is today, seated at the right hand of the Father, that glory that we're asked to behold as in a mirror, that glory that we're asked to behold. If you want to look at something, behold the glory of the Lord as in a mirror, and you'll see the new creation that you have been made because you have been made in his image and in his likeness is who you've been made. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, my God. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you, my God. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this message from Reformed Church. If you have, please share this with someone else and help us get this unpopular message to the world. If you'd like to support Reform Church, you can do so at reforminus.com give. Also on our website, you can take advantage of our free messages, articles, and even full discipleship courses. Start reforming your mind now at reforminus.com.